Begin reading at verse 1, I'll read through verse 29, Joshua chapter 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Amen. That's what the Lord said to Joshua. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, then arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city, and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai her king, as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof, and the cattle thereof, shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua rose, and all the people of war, to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out thirty thousand mighty men of valor, and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. Go not very far from the city, but be ye all ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city. And it shall come to pass, when they come out against us, as at the first, that we will flee before them. For they will come out after us, till we have drawn them from the city, for they will say, They flee before us as at the first, therefore we will flee before them. Then ye shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it shall be, when ye have taken the city, that ye shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord shall ye do. See, I have commanded you. Joshua therefore sent them forth, and they went to lie in ambush, and abode between Bethel and Ai, on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and numbered the people, and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And all the people, even the people of war that were with him, went up, and drew nigh, and came before the city, and pitched on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai. And he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And when they had set the people, even all the host that was on the north side of the city, and their liars in wait on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. And it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it, that they hasted and rose up early, and the men of the city went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, at a time appointed before the plain. But he wished not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them, and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them. And they pursued after Joshua, and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went not out after Israel. And they left the city open and pursued after Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it unto thy hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. And the ambush arose quickly out of the place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city and took it and hasted and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city, and that the smoke of the city ascended. Then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. And the other issued out of the city against them, so, that, so they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and they smote them, so that they let none of them remain or escape. And the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. 
And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness, wherein they chased them. And when they were all fallen on the edge of the sword, until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned unto Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. And so it was that all that fell that day, both of men and women, were 12,000, even all the men of Ai. Some have said that the 12,000 there refers to all the men of Ai, and the men and women referred to earlier in verse 25 is really encompassing all the rest of Ai. It's possible uh, that it could be read that way. And I'll also remind you that there were those who had joined the fight from Bethel. Bethel was, I'm not exactly sure how far apart it was. Some, I read a mile, some say three miles. I'm not exactly sure. In fact, they're not even sure where AI is. Those who try to pinpoint the ancient cities, not exactly sure where it is to, to this day. But they were in close proximity to one another. And so Bethel, the, the AI, after the first, uh, after the defeat, um, probably expected a, a re-encounter with, with the Israelites, asked their neighbors, Bethel, to join them in the fight. And so Ai and Bethel are named together back in verse 17 um, that joined together in the fight. But they were all put to death. I'll not say anything really about Bethel today, but remember that Bethel was a significant city in the, nation, the history of the nation of Israel. In fact, I'm not going to say much about this. I'll throw it out here as well. You go back to, to Genesis chapter, I believe it's Genesis chapter 12, and you'll find that, that Abraham um, made an altar between Bethel and Ai. It's interesting that what's going on here, the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham is actually beginning at the very place where Abraham first built an altar in worship of the Lord. That's interesting. That was 400 years earlier. Verse 26, For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear, until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai, only the cattle and the spoil of that city Israel took for a prey unto themselves, according unto the word of the Lord which he commanded Joshua. And Joshua burnt Ai and made it in heap forever, even a desolation unto this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city, and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. The writing of, the, of, the, of this account. 400 years after God promised Abraham that this land would be inhabited by his descendants, the sins of the Amorites are now full. You remember that's what God told Abraham back when he gave the promise. He said, the sins of the Amorites are not yet full. But as God promised, they are now being expelled from the land because of their wickedness, not because of the righteousness of Israel, but because of the wickedness of the Amorites. This is what makes the, de the, the defeat at Ai so alarming to Joshua. You remember back in chapter 7 and verse 7, Joshua in prayer said to the Lord God, Wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us unto the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? He remembered the promise that God gave to Abraham. This was a fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant. And so for them to encounter Ai and for Ai to rout them and to discourage them and to make them essentially weak as water in heart... Something was going on. Something wasn't right. Joshua was confused. As well he should have been. As oftentimes happens to us, doesn't it? When things happen in our lives that don't seem to match the promises that God has made to us. But God wants a holy people. Did you know that holiness is more important to God 
than it is to you and me. And it's more important to us than many other, the promises that God has given. It's more important to us than even some of those promises, so that some of those promises will be withheld from us as people until we get things right in our lives. That is a clear message that's being sent to us in Joshua 7 and 8. Jehovah God is no more pleased with sin in His own people than He was the Amorites. You remember what He said to the nation of Israel, if these same sins characterize you, I will spew you out of the land. You remember those promises that God made to Israel? And so at the very outset of their encounter, possessing the land that had been promised to them, God is making a point to His people. Obey me. Listen to me. Don't, don't take cut shorts. Don't do your own thing. Do what I say to you. Chapter 8 is not an account of Israel simply taking a larger army and overpowering Ai. It is a larger army, but that's not the point. Whereas they had two or 3,000 before, now they've got 30,000. That's not the issue. That's not what we're to be seeing as we read Joshua 7 and 8 together. The fact of the matter is, had Israel not dealt with sin in the camp, which we've already looked at in previous messages, had they not dealt with sin in the camp, and had they not followed the Lord's instructions, they would not have succeeded the second time, regardless of how many people they took. There are lessons here for us. Lessons for us as individual believers. Lessons for us as a church. This is a message about the sanctification of God's people. This is a message about spiritual recovery today as we move into Joshua chapter 8. It is victory following a devastating defeat. And let me say to you at the outset, failure need not, and I would add to that, failure must not be the last word in the Christian life. And failure need not, it must not be the last word in the life of a church. When sin has crept into our lives, sin has overtaken and overpowered us, and we have experienced a fall in our lives, that is not the end of the story. There is life after repentance, and oftentimes when I'm dealing with people who have been through a, a tragic, disastrous time in their lives due to sinful choices, I like to say to them, there is life after sin. There is life after repentance. There is victory after defeat. And this is a primary message of Joshua chapter 8. There is a marked contrast as you read Joshua 7 and 8 together. A contrast in the way these chapters begin. And it deserves our attention. And really, this is what is really forming my thoughts or guiding me as I bring the message today. As I saw this distinction between the two chapters. I believe there's a point the historian could have recorded the history of these events any number of ways. But this is the way he recorded them guided by the Holy Spirit in the recording of these events. In chapter 7, he began by exposing the cause of the defeat at Ai. You remember what the cause was? It was the anger of the Lord due to sin in the camp. The cause of their defeat wasn't their maneuvering. It wasn't the way they went about the, the battle. It was because God was angry. The anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel, or Joshua 7, 1 says. And it was because of the accursed thing. It was because of sin in the camp. The interaction between Joshua and the Lord. It's interesting. It follows the defeat. You don't see Joshua praying. You don't see Joshua spending time with the Lord in prayer before the attack upon Ai, you see, according to the record here, he is spending time in prayer after the attack, after the devastating defeat. 
What would have happened had Joshua spent time with the Lord in prayer before the attack upon Ai? I know it's speculative, but I have a hunch that had that taken place, there would have been a different outcome. Perhaps sin would have been discovered before the battle of Ai. But something was wrong. Something was going wrong. I believe that there was a seed or at least a worm at work, not only in Achan's life, but perhaps in the camp of Israel. And God needed to deal with this at the outset of their venture into the promised land. The plan for defeating Ai in chapter 7 has no reference to the Lord, no reference to God. Perhaps they were presumptuous after the victory over Jericho. We beat that impregnable city. The walls came, came down as we just marched around the city. Well, we don't need any just a couple thousand men is all it's going to take for Ai. That's a cinch. The indication from the record is that they proceeded in their own strength. The battle was not the Lord's. They were not trusting Him. I, I, there's going to be comments made along the way here that I, maybe these are the thoughts that God has for you today. And some of the things I, I maybe want to press later won't come to you. But please hear this. If you are facing a battle, don't make the battle yours. Make it the Lord's. Don't enter the struggle trusting yourself. Trust the Lord. It seems that that's not what was going on in chapter 7, at least in the first encounter with Ai. Then chapter 8 begins very differently. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. The Lord is once again speaking. The Lord is once again directing. He's not saying, look out among you. He's not saying, sanctify yourselves. He's saying, I'm with you now. His realized presence has returned. And he says in verse 8, or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 1, the latter part of verse 1, he says, I've given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people, excuse me, back up, uh, see, you see, rise, go up to Ai. See, I have given unto thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. See. See. It's interesting. This is language very much like that which are spoken before the battle of Jericho. Go back to chapter 6 and verse 2. When Joshua encountered the captain of the Lord's host, and the Lord said to Joshua, See. I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And then the instructions were given. Here again, before this battle of Ai, as the way, as, as it should have been, the Lord is now saying to Joshua, See! I have given it to you. See, this is an expression of faith. It's the language of faith. See! It's the language that the people of God are familiar with. As we live by faith, as we walk by faith, we're able to see. We're seeing what others can't see. There's a confidence that comes to us that doesn't come otherwise when we see what can only be seen by faith. Unbelief, on the other hand, sin on the other hand, is blinding, it's distracting, and it depends upon fleshly reasoning. We only need two or three thousand. We got this one. We don't need to consult God. We don't need to trust God. We've got this one. I want to say to you at this point that confidence in battle is not necessarily an evidence of faith. Confidence in your struggles, confidence in your life, confidence in the choices you're making is not necessarily an indication that you are seeing. Faith is guided by the Word of God. Faith responds to what the Lord says. And so you have it in verse 8. 
Joshua says, according to the commandment of the Lord shall you do. See, there you have it again, see. That's a pretty significant word that's used. This is a matter of faith. A matter of faith is the Lord has spoken and I see. I see what He's saying. And I'm going to march according to the orders of the Lord. Verse 27, only the cattle and the spoil of that city Israel, of that city Israel took for a prey unto themselves according to the word of the Lord which He commanded Joshua. They, they went, you see, after the first Knowing what the accursed thing was, they didn't overreact with Ai. They didn't say, well, we better not take anything now. I mean, look what happened when Achan took something from Jericho. Well, it was an accursed thing. They were told not to. Listen, you don't have to build walls that God doesn't build. If God says, it's okay, it's okay. It's not a matter of faith to go beyond what God says. It's a matter of faith to take it. If God says take it, take it. If God says enjoy it, enjoy it. It's not a matter of faith to say, oh no. In fact, I'm going to build a fence over here and over here and over here and over here. This is a pretty significant point that I really hadn't intended to make, but it's just coming to me right now. Maybe it's needed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Faith is seeing what God says and acting accordingly. And doing and taking what God has given you the liberty to do and to take. Not what you and your flesh has determined. Or that makes sense. And I say that to you because unbelief and sin can be blinding, distracting, and it depends upon fleshly reasoning. We need to be careful there. Just because... There's confidence. Doesn't mean it's faith. Now there is much encouragement in this account. Especially if you're here today and you're on the other side of defeat. And you're finding difficulty getting back into the fight. Maybe feeling like you want to retreat to what feels like a safer place. What would be a, a safer place? Well, for... For Joshua was on the east side of Jordan. He said, would to God we had been content on the other side of Jordan. It's kind of like he wants to go back. He wants to retreat. And God's saying, no, retreat is not the answer. Backing up, going back is not the answer. The message of God to our souls on the heels of defeat is rise up and fight. I've given you the land, God says. Do as I say, and you're going to be blessed. We have that theme in other places. Uh, uh, Psalm 37, you can read it later. You'll find that theme in Psalm 37. You may may fall. You may fall, but, but, but God will not leave you in that place. He'll restore you. And in the restoration, there'll be blessing. I want you to notice, on the other side of defeat... On the other side of dealing with the sin, victory is promised. Therefore, you hear these words in chapter 8, verse 1, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Now this is in the face of a battle. This is in the face of a conflict. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Fear and discouragement was caused by defeat, and defeat was the result of sin. The reason God had to say this is because God was telling them to do the very thing they had just done and lost. And there's some of you here today who have who've experienced that. You've been defeated time after time after time, and you hear people say, get back in the fight, and you're, you're just a bit squirmish at the very least. You, you fear there's discouragement. I will tell you this, if, if you're harboring unrepentant sin as Israel was, you can expect that fear and discouragement is going to rule your heart. By the way, I'm using the word discouragement. Dismayed and discouragement are synonymous here. Unless sin, unless the accursed thing in your life is destroyed, or in the church's life is destroyed, fear and dismay should fill us. Did you hear that? Should. 
Destruction is all we can reasonably expect. I go over to Galatians chapter 6 and I hear these words, For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's all. That's all you can expect. You keep sowing to the flesh and that's all you can expect. You ought to fear if you're not dealing with a cursed thing, a forbidden thing, a thing God says, that's mine, or God says, don't touch that, don't deal with that. If we're not willing to face our sins and put them away, God will remain against us. God will be angry with us. Oh, listen to me, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no eternal destruction. If you're in Christ here, do not misunderstand what I'm saying. When we speak of the anger of God against you, it is a, it is an ang- it is a loving anger. Hey, preacher, that sounds strange. I didn't have time to trace it out, so you do your homework and you can prove me wrong. If you can, do so. But it just struck me, and I I quickly traced the verses. Uh, I'm saying I I didn't do my homework in that I didn't have time. It came to me just before the service today, so I, I couldn't delve into looking at every single verse. But as I did a cursory review of the verses, this is what stood out to me. When you find this expression, the anger of the Lord was kindled, or the wrath of God was kindled. Do you know who it's referring to? It's not the heathen nations of the world. It's His own people. That's interesting. It's His own people. In other words, fast forward to those of us who are in Christ on this side of the cross. God... God's love has been demonstrated in that in that Christ is our Lord and, and our Savior. And there is no eternal destruction, but as a father chastens the child whom he loves, so will our Heavenly Father. And there is anger in that. And you can kindle the anger of God. You can kindle the wrath of God, if you want to use that word. Not a forever wrath. Not a condemnation wrath. But I love you, wrath, and I'm going to correct you, anger. So there is a a measure to that wrath, a measure to that anger. And you see that in the Word of God in reference to Israel. It was measured. You see, with the unbeliever, with the ungodly, if you're here outside of Jesus Christ, there will be no measure to the wrath of God poured out upon you. The wrath of God hangs over you, ready to be unveiled in the day of judgment. But for the believer, that's not true. For the believer, it's a measured anger, a measured wrath in this lifetime that is given to us in the form and for the purpose of chastening, to correct us, to help us. Brethren, we cannot, we must not take sin lightly. Individually or as a church body, we must not take sin lightly. Well, Israel did, but then God dealt with them. And there is this, there is the, the, they, the scripture says that, that fear and discouragement was to vanish from them. God says, fear not, nor be dismayed. Fear not, nor be discouraged. And this happens when we are assured that God is with us. The devastating defeat at Ai was the result of God withdrawing His presence. We saw that. And God says, until you deal with this, my presence is going to be withheld from you. But obviously, His presence is restored because He says to them now in chapter 8, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. I am with you. Look at chapter, or excuse me, chapter 8 and verse 7. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. You don't have to fear. You don't have to be dismayed. You don't have to be discouraged. I'm with you, God is saying. I'm going to deliver it into your hand. You see that again in verse 18. The Lord said to Joshua, stretch out. They're in the battle here. Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thy hand. 
And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. God promised, God's promised presence and victory precedes the instruction to battle. I remind you here today, a battle plan is useless without the presence of our God. And Joshua knew this. Listen to what Moses says in chapter 38 of, De- uh, excuse me, 31 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 31 verses 7 and 8. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. For thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them. And thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. And this is repeated to Joshua after Moses' death. In chapter 1, we saw it already in an earlier message. Have not I commanded thee, verse 9, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. If you know that God is with you, Joshua, if you know that I am with you, Israel, if you know that I am with you, you do not have to fear. You do not have to be discouraged. I will give you what I promise. Isaiah repeats this. 41 in verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Sometimes, sometimes it feels like the spiritual life is just knocked right, the wind is knocked out of us. Events can happen in life where it weakens us. When we, in those times, search our hearts before God and we, and we either deal with a sin that is brought to our attention or we conclude as we set our faces before God and we ask Him to search our hearts and we say, God, I don't know, I don't see anything in my life or our lives. Then we're able to hear the voice of our God say to us, then don't fear and don't be discouraged. Get into the fight. Stand up. Face the enemy. We hear this again in Hebrews 13 and verse 6, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. This is not, that's not a promise for every person to take. That's a promise for God's people. That's a promise for God's people who have dealt with sin in their lives. And in the midst of the battle, we continue to trust Him in the battle, not just the beginning of the battle. I say to you, Christian, are you fearful and discouraged because of defeat and battle against the world, the flesh and the devil, who have and always will seek to destroy you? Have you retreated from the fight in fear? And I exhort you here at this point, Repent of whatever sin has defeated you and listen to our covenant keeping keeping God who says to us, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. I exhort you, look unto Jesus Christ. Fix your mind upon Him. Do you understand that the works of the devil cannot ultimately succeed? He came to destroy the works of the devil. Do you understand that sin cannot have dominion over you? There is no sin that is so dominating in your life that you cannot overcome, Christian. I'm talking to you. Christian, the world is crucified to you. The flesh is not your master. And so you must face the enemy without fear or discouragement. But what if I fall again? That's fear. Don't face the enemy with fear. Face the enemy with the confidence that God is with you. You have a helper. Jesus Christ has committed Himself 
to you without fear or discouragement. But this is the foundation. This is not the end of the story. This is the foundation. If that's all you get from the message today, you very likely will leave and fall flat on your face. Because the story goes on, doesn't it? There's a reason why God says, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. It's because they had something that they needed to do. Faith needed to act. That's why the Scripture says victory comes from God through faith. And so God says, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. And then clear instruction follows. Yes, there's a promise, but there's a path to receive the promise. And that path I call the path of faith. It's the path of faith. God is not blessing Israel in chapter 8 with victory, because he's a sentimental God and feels sorry for his people after the first defeat. God does not promise his protecting presence and blessing upon us no matter what we do. God says, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. And then he says, take all the people of war with thee. And arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. Thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. You, You see, God is placing a responsibility on his people. His promise to be with them follows repentance, and then He lays out a plan. He doesn't lay out the plan first. He deals with their sin. They deal with their sin. And then He says, Now, now, don't fear. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Rise up. Get into the battle. Here's how I want you to do it. So the battle plan that was laid out before Joshua and Israel includes 30,000 mighty men of valor. Equipped individuals, gifted individuals. It included a nighttime maneuver. It included an ambush by way of a decoy. God told Joshua that Ai, aided by Bethel, would be drawn out of their fort if he would retreat as they did in the first attack. Think about that. That kind of almost sounds like weakness. Are you sure? Lord, are you sure that's what you want us to do? How can we be... There is no discussion like this. I'm I'm just bringing in a discussion. You know, are you sure? If we... If we turn around and run, like we did last time, what, what, are they really, are we really gonna win? But Joshua, in faith, led Israel exactly as God commanded, and as we read, completely destroyed Ai, hanging the king from a tree until evening, and raising a heap of stones upon him at the gate, of the burned city as a memorial to God's victory over their enemy. The victory at Ai and the blessings that followed were a result of the obedience of faith. Do you all see that? A result of the obedience of faith. Listen to this. God's sovereignty and His eternal plan does not discard the necessity of faith. It includes it. Do you hear that? God's sovereignty and His eternal plan does not discard the necessity of faith. It includes it. Had Joshua and Israel not obeyed, Ai would not have fallen.
But Israel, Joshua and Israel did exactly as God said. And the result was exactly as God determined it to be. By the way, the faith that was exercised was exactly as God intended it to be. God was in it all. But God didn't believe for them and God didn't act for them. They had to do that. And did it, they did. 3,000 warriors, humanly speaking, was more than enough for an open frontal attack against Ai. But it would not have been God's way. An ambush. By the way, there was one other ambush in Scriptures. It's at the end of Judges. You'll see another similar kind of attack in relationship to Benjamin, the tribe of, of Benjamin. Remember when Israel had been defeated the first time? And an ambushment was set up then as well, similar to this one. It was a, a military maneuver that came from God's instruction. By the way, it's a military maneuver that's been used ever since in battle. A decoy. And we could get sidetracked with some thoughts on that one, but we'll, I'll leave that one alone. Joshua was trusting God. Brethren, we must engage the enemy God's way. If we don't engage the enemy God's way, we are not living by faith. We're not walking by faith. And we cannot rest upon a concept of the sovereignty of God that He's going to give us the victory anyhow. And oh, we must not forget our dependence upon God in the battle. You see how these go hand in hand? In, in other words, that's what faith is all about. Faith is saying, I trust God. I believe God. He's going to give me the victory as I do what He says. He's going to give the victory. The evidence that Joshua was trusting God is he held his hand, the spear in his hand. He held it up until the defeat was Total. Verse 26, Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Does that kind of remind you of a, an earlier battle with the Amalekites where Moses was up on the top of the hill and was lifting his hands? And you know who was down in the valley fighting? Joshua. Joshua. And then when Moses' hands were lifted up, they were victorious. When they came down, they were defeated. Hands went up. They were engaging. They were doing what God said. But there was still a, a, a dependence upon God indicated by the lifting up of hands. And brethren, isn't that maybe something of what Paul meant in, in Timothy when he said to Timothy, I, all, all men everywhere lifting up holy hands in prayer. Perhaps what is being said there is that you support the labors of the gospel as holy men are engaged in the battle when they're down on the field engaging in the battle. You, you are lifting up those hands in prayer, in your prayer, a dependence upon God, even as we're engaging in the battle. Our fight against the enemy of our souls is a fight of faith. We must not underestimate the significance of the demonstration of faith. It is, as 1 John says, the victory that overcomes the world. And as Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. But please understand that faith is not merely assenting to the truth of God. Faith is not merely assenting to the promise of God. Well, God's promise that I believe Him. No, faith in the Christian life is believing God to the point of action. Living life in the way that He has prescribed. Some of you are living defeated lives. And there's particular, particular area, areas in your life that you just simply cannot gain victory over. Why? Let me assume that you're a believer. Let me assume that you're a child of God. Maybe that's assuming too much. You need to search your own heart before God. Maybe you need to be born again. Maybe that is the fundamental issue for you. But maybe not. 
One thing I know, Jesus has promised, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And He has given every new covenant believer the seal of the Holy Spirit. And He is our ever-present help. Because we have Him with us, we hear those words, Fear not, neither be dismayed. He is with us. Don't live under the cloud of defeat. Deal with sin when it's pointed out to you. Don't ignore what God says to you. I had a a morning this last week where just the sense of my own sin, and it wasn't necessarily in this case any particular sin, it was just the sense of who I am by nature. And it overwhelmed me. And you would have thought something was really wrong with me had you seen me at that point. But really, it was nothing really wrong with me. It was something really right with me. God was blessing me with a sense of who I was apart from Christ, which brought me to Christ afresh. Too many of you are living without a relationship to Jesus Christ. See, when we talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're not just talking about a relationship with your own thoughts and your own concepts and your own mind. We're talking about engaging Him. We're talking about engaging engaging the Lord God, Jesus Christ. We're talking about engaging Him in light of His Word. And if you're born again, you have the power within you because of Christ to defeat the enemy. There is no excuse for walking in defeat. There is no excuse for living a defeated Christian life. Except for yourself. Sin and defeat must not characterize your life. Our God has given us clear instructions for victory. Now, let me just... I'm going to list some things here as we bring this to a close. I'm going to list a few things here. And I, I want these to be... These are reminders. And hopefully they're helpful to you. Because you know, reading Joshua chapter 8, it's a military maneuver, military action, and, and we have to go to the... We have to go to other Scriptures to bring these thoughts to bear upon ourselves. How are we going to engage the enemy? How does God tell us to engage the enemy with some expectation of victory? Let me begin with this. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Renew your mind with the Word of God. When's the last time you spent any any real productive time in the Word of God? When is the last time God actually dealt with you in some particular and powerful way through the Word of God? When was the last time you experienced a renewing of your mind of the way you were thinking about something that was wrong, that was off, by way of the Word of God. This is fundamental. Most people, I don't know that there's an exception to this, but when I deal with people who are, who at least are recognizing the struggle in their lives, recognizing the defeat of their lives, and I ask them this question, do you have a daily, regular, Engagement with the Word of God. Is it in your heart? Not not just do you have a, you know, I read that and got that over with and I'm on with my day. I'm talking about it's in your heart. The Word of God is there. It's been planted as a seed. It's there. And, and And you're musing upon that Word. When's the last time? Every case. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't regularly do that. And I just want to stop there with such individuals and say, then you're not really serious about winning the fight. You're not really serious about living in victory. I mean, you may want a lot of things, but you're not really serious. You really don't see sin to be the serious thing that it is. Because thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Simple. 
for the child of God. And then prayer. How can you expect, how can you expect to engage in battle if you don't have a communion with the God who is going to give you the victory in the battle? Prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You know where that's found? That's found at the end of the list of the put on the whole armor of God. Prayer. It's vital. Not just a simplistic expression that you call prayer, but a true dependence upon our Father in prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. If you do not aid and help, and if you are not the one who gives me the victory, I'll fail. I'll fail. Do you even believe that? So much so that you actually pray to Him and talk to Him in that way. Submission. Do you realize that if... And and the Word and prayer bring submission. Produce this. These all kind of work together. Here are some practical things that the Scriptures tell us to do. You say, why do you say submission? Because James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I mean, are, 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 have you got this? Have you, are, are you, you can win this battle? Or are you going to submit yourself to God? Full submission. A surrender to God. Resisting the devil on the terms that God establishes. Have you heard God say these things? Flee fornication? Then why are you flirting with fornication? Why are you watching some of the things you're watching? Why are you listening to some of the things you're listening to? Why are you putting things that you're putting before your mind? Why are you doing that? That's not fleeing fornication. And we're living in a culture that's just inundated with fornication. I mean, when you speak against fornication, you're the laughing stock. It's recreational sport. Fornication is a recreational sport in this country. And maybe the world, I don't know, but at least in this country. We're not hurting anybody. We're consenting adults. Flee fornication. Flee youthful lusts. Do you hear that? This is, this is a battle plan here. And it comes from God. And if you're living by faith, you're in submission to God. You're listening to Him. He says, flee. He says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Abstain. Your flesh is weak. And this is not just sexual lust. It's any lust. Any attention that your flesh is wanting to bring on itself. Abstain from anything that will cause trouble for you. How about this? For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And you can say all you want about what that may or may not mean, but it says it sounds pretty clear. I better be mortifying the deeds of this body if I want to live. That means I've got to get radical. Jesus put it this way. Did I offend you? Think about it. Did your hands offend you? Cut it off. Oh, is, is Christ instructing us to get, to get physical? I don't believe that's the point at all. Because the fact of the matter is, you can pluck your eye out and still be full of lusts. It's simply take radical measures in dealing with sin. Radical measures. Or at least what others may view to be radical. Sin is that harmful to us. Through the Spirit. Did you hear that? Through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body. Through the Spirit. Don't fight the flesh with the flesh. You start, you start engaging in all kinds of fleshly activities to, de- to defeat the flesh, you will never win through the Spirit. 
Mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. One more, Galatians 6.14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Can I read that to you again? God forbid, Paul said. Can you say this? Christian, God forbid that I should glory, save, or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. The world has lost its appeal, its luster. Because my mind, my affections have been captured captivated by the glory of Jesus Christ, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is and what He has done to deliver my guilty soul. Is Jesus more precious than anything else your heart may desire in this world? Is He really? Can you honestly say yes to that? I don't believe we ought to quickly answer that question lest we deceive ourselves? Is He worthy of full obedience? Full obedience. Not picking and choosing. Not what's comfortable for you. Not what fits your agenda. Full obedience in every area of life. If so, past defeat is not the end of your story. You hear that? If you are glorying, in, the, in fact, I would suggest to you that past defeat because of sin that's been identified, brought to the cross, makes the cross of Jesus Christ shine that much more glorious and motivates you. A, I will not stand in your way. If the cross of Jesus Christ is your glory. So I say to you and to me, if you have experienced defeat, if you have stumbled, if you have chosen a path through whatever temptations in your life, the enemy has overcome you. I say to you, identify that. Repent of that. Come to the cross with that. See Jesus Christ, who by the way, he took the curse upon Himself. I know at the end of Ai, the king was hung upon the tree. Do you know the king hanging upon the tree was not the, was not the curse? It was the curse that hung upon the tree. The accursed thing was hung upon the tree. And so it happened in Christ. The curse was taking a place. The cur he took our curse upon Himself there upon the cross. And that ought to motivate you to rise up and to press on by grace through faith and to face the enemy with the victory that comes to those of us to whom God says, fear not, nor be dismayed. Dismayed, do not be discouraged. Can I encourage you, don't let your past sins define you. Okay? Don't let who you have been define you. Rise up. Lay that upon Christ so that from this point forward, the cross of Jesus Christ and the glory of Christ and all of that, there's so many parts to that, will define you. A follower of Jesus Christ, our Joshua, who will lead us to victory against any AI that stands in our way. Amen. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the encouragement of Your Word, for these examples that You've given.